All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Hashtag Event Icons, where you get to chat with the icons of the events industry. Uh, my name is Alex Plaxum. I am one of your regular co-hosts, and today we're going to be talking about something that is near and dear to my heart, because it's actually the first industry conference that I ever attended, which is the Meeting Professionals International World Education Congress. And each year, MPI is working to raise the bar on the experience, event design, and meetings that change the way we meet. Um, and today, you're going to get to meet the team behind this change and learn how they're collaborating to create spaces and places where dialogue is enabled. Um, so let's get to it. It's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, so you know what that means. It's time for another episode of Hashtag Event Icons, presented by Endless Events. The show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. Use the question panel on the webinar to submit your questions. Or you can hop on Twitter, submit your questions with hashtag event icons. We'll be answering your questions live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better conversation we can have. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter and Facebook. Just tell your friends to watch at www.event-icons.com. Com. Now, without any further delay, this is Hashtag Event Icons. Today's guests are Crystal Ships. Uh, every successful association is a talented program manager, and Crystal Ships is no exception. She's been providing her ex expertise and experiences to the meetings and events industry for over five years. And hi, Crystal. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we also have Lori Pumarkham, who is the Manager of Global Education Event Production for Meeting Professionals International. She has over 14 years of experience as a meeting planner, show producer, and industry educator. So welcome to the show, Lori. Thank you. That means I started when I was like three. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Well, I'm actually glad that you said that because it's, uh, oh, and we have Lindsay. Hi, Lindsay. Lindsay is one of our newest co-hosts. Oh. So Hi, she's on mute. <laughs> I am here. I just didn't know if we needed to go ahead. And so I was just answering the bat signal. But if you've got it, Alex, and you're already there. Hello, everyone. I was so excited about this session, guys. It sounds fantastic. Um, yeah, I think we're good. Um, but if you want to stick around, you're welcome to. I mean, if you wouldn't mind another another soul, I'm always there and I'll sit in the quiet in quiet moment until I go, but what's that mean? Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks for joining us, Lindsay. And um, so, yeah, we were just introducing our guests. And um, the first question we ask all of our new guests to the show is what got you into the events industry? And if you weren't in the events industry, what would you be doing? Crystal, do you want to go first or you want me to? You can go first. <laughs> okay, okay. So uh, I started out in the advertising agency world and quickly got put on PR and event campaigns. And then in 2000, I guess it would be six, uh, a lot of our clients were home builders and that's when the crash was starting to happen. And I thought, yeah, I uh, might need to, to do events full time. And then it just kind of took me from there and worked at uh, different associations, worked as an event producer, called shows, uh, decorator, all of all of it. I uh, had a little stint at a hotel doing weddings and figured out I'd never want to do weddings again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it just, the path led me here along the way and I ended up at uh, MPI and I've been here for four and a half years already. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I can't believe it's been that long. My first World Education Congress was six years ago. It was wow. 2013. So yeah, I, it seems like just yesterday. Um, now, if you weren't in the events industry, what would you be doing? So I love antiques. I mean, like a crazy passion. I had to buy a 1920s cash register, like I need one. Um, so I would own an antique store. I think this is the first time we've heard antique store as <laughs> You know, so now, Lori, I want you to come down to Waco with me and go to that great big 
like um, antiquing thing they have on the weekends. Do you know what I'm talking about? I it's am in. <laughs> I'm going to tell my husband it's for work, and then I'll explain <laughs> everything else no, later. No, we could totally do a site with him along the way. Hill Country's there. That Marriott always needs a walkthrough. <laughs> I, I'm feeling that. That's good. <laughs> Great. And Crystal, same question. What got you into the events industry? So um, I had a funny start to the events industry. Um, in college, I majored in recreation administration. And a lot of people, they're asking, like, you're a recreation director? Like, what do you do? Like, do you teach people how to kick soccer balls? Or what do you do? <laughs> so my advisor introduced me to the events world. And he told me a little bit about it. And he thought that I would be a great fit for it. So as I went home over the summer, I ended up working for my aunt's event business. And I started off as a host. And then I just continued to stay on in the industry with her. And I learned so much more about event coordinating. So then that's what led me to MPI because of my advisor. He told me about MPI. And I ended up joining. So I've been at MPI for two years now. And she's smart a rock star. <laughs> yeah, she's <Thank> great. <laughs> yeah, smart advisor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if you weren't in the events industry, what would you be doing? Soccer balls? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I probably would be, um, I would have to say I would own a clothing boutique. I, I am, I did events for New York Fashion Week and it was right up my alley. So I love clothes. <laughs> so awesome. I would definitely own a boutique. While they're shopping for antiques, you and I can go shopping for <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Awesome. Well, you know, let's let's get started talking about World Education Congress. For those who don't know, uh, can you please share what WEC is and some of the history of the event? Sure. So WEC is where all of our members, oh, I shouldn't say all, a large percentage of our members and then quite a few non-members come to learn um, in terms of education, peer-to-peer -peer learning, networking, and it's really grown to 2,500 attendees. Uh, last year, we were in Indianapolis, and they were a great host, and this year, we're in Toronto, which we're very excited about, and we have a, a huge Canadian membership, and they've really been rallying around this event as well. So I'm glad you mentioned the Canadian membership because we have to give a shout out to them, especially because I think we can't call it WEC this year, correct? We have to call it WEC, as all the Canadians call it. <laughs> that is new to me, but no, and I've have you not it. heard this? Yes, I can confirm it. In the office here, we get that oh. all the time. A lot of attendees have been calling and they're like, hey, I want to learn about the WEC convention. I'm like, Okay. <laughs> yes. So, so there's this thing where the Canadians, at least every Canadian uh, that I've met, calls WEC World Education Congress WEC, and uh, the Americans call it WEC. So you can always tell where someone's from when you ask them about WEC. It's fascinating. <laughs> When I heard we were going to be in Toronto this year, I got very excited because I assumed that everyone has to call it WEC now. We will follow suit. We're going to, we're going to take a stance for that. That sounds good to me. <laughs> awesome. So um, last year, um, there was a pretty big overhaul of not only the content, but also the experience design. And anyone who attended last year would really be able to say like, this was, this was a different WEC than anything that we had experienced yeah. before. Um, so right. you, can you tell us a bit about what, the process of that redesign was like? Sure. So we went through uh, an event design canvas process. Uh, and I've also shared that in our resources link where we thought about every single one of our stakeholders and thought, how could we completely redesign this to uh, be in line with what their needs are? And normally you would take little changes and you would prototype and do a little something different year after year. And we said, no, we're just going to completely redo it. Um, a lot of sweat and tears and sleepless nights uh, went into it. And I would say it was very successful. There are things that we are tweaking for this next year, but essentially it's an open floor concept where we have educational theaters, our tabletops, 
um, our networking, our MPI central, everything is really on a show floor. And we put it in the hands of the attendees to choose what their experience is. We have 30 minute sessions, hour long sessions, 90 minute. So they can kind of pick what they're interested in and then leave other times for some of the other activities that we have, um, you know, whether it be CSR related or meetup groups so that um, it's not the traditional mold and we have a lot more flexibility. Yeah, I can tell you that there was definitely um, some trepidation I felt like um, with the theaters, especially, you know, for me as a speaker, I, I spoke at WC last year, I spoke at WC the year before, and um, the theaters, I was worried about sound and the quality and the experience and, you know, was it going to be really loud? Was it going to be shouting over people? And I had a fantastic experience. I actually really yeah. enjoyed it. Um, and then the way that the, um, the keynotes were, um, these, uh, what were they called? They're, they were called pep rallies. Pep rallies. Yes. Yeah. So I saw that on the agenda and I was like, what is a pep rally? <laughs> that is crazy. I don't, un I don't understand this. And when you got in the room, you got it. You felt, mm -hmm. you knew exactly why it was called a pep rally because there was an energy in that room that was not one that you experienced in any keynote at a WEC before. Um, and there were risers so there were you know different height levels and it was just it was fascinating the way that the keynotes were able to capture that energy and really create a unique experience that was different than any keynote that i've experienced before you know we learned um heavily from uh wc 17 or wex 17 where <laughs> <laughs> that um our general sessions were you know, we tried something different that year within the opening keynote was really long and uh, kudos to our leadership team for deciding, okay, we, we need to listen to the feedback and do something different. And um, so we had those 45 minute, like you, you mentioned pep rallies, one at the beginning of the day and end of the day. And also keeping in mind with the real neuroscience, I know it sounds like a scary word, but let's say brain friendly, um, brain friendly approach that people just kind of lose um, uh, concentration after that point and we wanted to end the day and start the day with these 45 minute um, pep rallies whether you call them I think you're leading towards bookends this year uh, to kind of uh, start the day and then recap what you learned to give some time for reflection uh, and it was very successful that was one of those things that definitely went well from our redesign that we heard great feedback on yeah and can you tell the audience a little bit about um, what the theaters were like and I know you know each theater was kind of themed if you could share a bit about that so we had different villages we had four different ones and Crystal you're gonna have to help me on this is <laughs> uh, innovation uh, um, experiential design what's the other one other two innovation experiential design um, leadership village Social, social and social village, yes. And so we had uh, kind of color coordinated those areas and our educational topics were um, based in that kind of area. So if you were really into technology, you might want to hang out in innovation a little bit longer. Uh, so that was the design of it. Now the, the theaters was, uh, you know, very, like you mentioned, a very scary part for attendees and speakers. Um, Freeman was really great about when you walked into the room, you could hear the speaker and they were glass enclosures with some drape. And when you walked into the room to sit down, you could hear everything fine. But if you were literally one foot uh, outside of those theaters, you couldn't hear well. So the experience was really, really great. Uh, we had a couple challenges the first session. We had them worked out by the afternoon. Uh, so I think it went pleasantly, uh, surprisingly well, because we were all nervous about it. Uh, we have tweaked a couple things for this upcoming year, uh, for more interactive peer-to-peer -peer breakout into group sessions, because I do think that was one thing missing in those, um, the theater floor. Uh, so we're, we've worked on a, a little bit of a redesign on that, but we still will have four large theaters on the show floor. Awesome. And the same uh, themed areas as well, or are the themes going to change a bit? 
far as I know, the, uh, the theme areas are all the same. Uh, I think a lot more people are versed into the flow of, of what to expect. Uh, and so I, it's all pretty much the same branding. Mm -hmm. Less confusing names of fancy <laughs> names of theaters. Because people, we, we overthought it. How many planners out there overthink things? I, yeah, I know I do. Yeah. <laughs> we tried to get a little too creative with instead of saying theater one, theater two, we were calling them huddles and workshops, and it was just too much. So we are going to simplify that labeling process um, and signage process for the next year, but a, a lot of that is staying the same. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So after 2018, uh, what was the impact of some of the changes? What, what did you see in survey responses and feedback? Um, you know, how, how have you taken that feedback into consideration for 2019? Yes. So I can tell you that event planners are the hardest to please when you're planning an event for event planners. <laughs> but we appreciate our audience because and our members because they will tell us how they feel and that's important in any kind of survey feedback. But uh, I think having some of the education sessions be um, outside of the show floor so it can be more breaking up into groups. Crystal's working very hard on also having some activities that will take you outside of the convention center. So I mean, it's a beautiful convention, convention center, but sometimes you want to get out and you want to get moving uh, as well. Uh, what are some other items you think in terms of feedback that we've worked on? I think, um, as you know, we also introduced last year the coaches program and having what the coaches program was, was you would have a staff member on each in each village that will be able to answer all of your questions. And having that program really helped a lot of our attendees with locations of rooms. Uh, like Lori mentioned, we had the room confusion, but having that staff member that's there at each village to tell you exactly where this room is or where this speaker is was very helpful. And then they also knew information about closing event things and just all WEC information. I, I think that was one of the best takeaways from um, what I heard from attendees. Mm -hmm. So what was your, and I, I'm sure there's a lot, but what was your favorite moment from WEC 2018? Mm. Crystal, I'm going to have you take this one. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say my favorite moment would have to be the WEC coaches. Um, that was my baby and, um, <laughs> I nurtured it and we really developed it and it ended up turning out great for us um, to go in and not have an idea of how you wanted this to be and then turn out exactly better than what you ever expected was kind of great for our team and it's going to be amazing for this year as well. So I, I would have to say the coaches program was my favorite part of WEC. <laughs> And uh, I would say mine, even though I didn't get to experience it, the airport arrivals. Yes. We had a, le <laughs> <laughs> yes, you loved it. You know, I, what amazing partners Indianapolis was because not many people can pull this off, but they had a lounge in the airport so that when you got off your flight, uh, you had uh, lounge furniture. You could, if you had pre-registered, you could get your badge, you could have a drink some music, someone to welcome you. And I the think- The bags were checked. Yes, the bags were checked. I mean, that set the tone is that you, yeah, you are, you're going places, you're a VIP no matter what level you're at. And it is time to kick your shoes off, learn, but enjoy yourself. It was really well done. So, so when you guys were designing the experience because the, the welcome was so amazing and then it kept going into the reception, you know, with the flower decorations and like everything, it just really seemed like the city rolled out the red carpet. Was that something that you had a vision for? Did the city come with that idea? You know, I would love to take credit for it. <laughs> not, it was not me. Um, uh, Indianapolis, the, they did a fabulous job. Um, Susie from their team, was just, they really got together and thought out every single detail. Um, and while I love going to, to top tier cities, um, you know, Indianapolis, they came in, I think they're typically a second tier city. And um, they really took the time and the thought process and the importance of the event and spent so much time in the details. 
Uh, and it really showed, I think, when I was traveling back the, uh, the last day, uh, I was, there was a bus taking me to the airport and then we got off the bus and there was someone from Indianapolis uh, thanking me for coming and giving me a blanket to get on the plane with. I mean, really? Their job was done. And I thought, oh, and they just, their hospitality level is just unmatched. So I did not experience the lounge because I got in super late that first night that I was there. I did take selfies with it though. <laughs> because I saw it and I was like, that looks amazing. I want to be a part of that. But I, yeah, I have to say Indianapolis, um, not only the destination, but also the volunteers, the local volunteers did an incredible job. I mean, there were handwritten welcome notes in like every hotel room. It was, it was just such a personal experience. Um, and I had never been to Indianapolis before, so I didn't really know what to expect. And I left there wanting to go back immediately, um, which I, I think is the most you can ask for from attending an event. And, you know, a lot of times when I attend events, because I speak a lot, I go to a lot of conferences, I go to cities I've never been to before. And I leave and I'm like, I went to the hotel and the convention center so I guess that's kind of cool. Like people ask me, oh, how was your trip? And I was like, eh, <laughs> it's cool, you know, whatever. <laughs> but Indianapolis, I, I really felt like I got to experience the city. I didn't get to see everything I would have liked to have seen. I, you know, want to go back. But it was just the right amount of welcome to Indianapolis, you know, this is this is WC in Indianapolis, and WC will not be the same anywhere else. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm excited to see what Toronto pulls together because Indianapolis set that bar high. Yeah, they did set it really, really high. Absolutely. And Toronto is great. It just has a different flair to it. I had actually never been to Toronto before, and when I went on my site visit, I was really trying to get my arms around what the message was that they wanted to send and in what the, the city was about. Um, and the people have been fabulous as well, and it, I think it really comes to mind is how international the city is. Their food and beverage experience is just on a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I cannot wait to see what they have uh, in terms of that. And there's a great pool for me, selfishly, because I do the education, <laughs> and a great pool of speakers to work with. Uh, so I think that's, that's been really nice as well. Well, actually, I have a question about that for the education, because I know with all the new things you've been trying, one of the sessions that I never miss at WEC or WC with my Americanisms <laughs> is Terry Brining's Senior Planning Roundtable. I, I look forward to it every year. And so I was always curious, is that something where we're going to see more sessions kind of like that, where she has that open dialogue or is it something where there's a, a, a different structure kind of what are you imagining mm -hmm. um, will be your focus for 2019 because I know there's been a lot of conversations about the different levels the planners bring from an expertise perspective. Yeah and um, Terry's not on the schedule to speak this year but the format is still there and Terry's fabulous she's always one of my favorites um, but we have a what we call an MPI mastermind session where it is breaking out and problem solving uh, and using some software that is anonymous so that you, if you have questions, you're not comfortable with raising your hand and sharing that those populate on a screen and that we can answer and tackle those. Um, a lot of our sessions are very uh, interactive and, and trying to find solutions to problems versus just being talked the whole time. Uh, even from we're doing some mock trials, so instead of just learning and contracting from someone telling you, you participate as sides of the jury, and it's very fun. Um, we want to, I mean, for me, I feel like our attendees are, are brilliant, and, and there is some great expertise in the room, and so we want to really cultivate that a little more. Uh, our theme for the narrative for this year, uh, similar to what it's been the past two years, stop planning, excuse me, stop planning meetings, start designing experiences, but we've twisted it a little bit to be stop planning meetings, start designing shared experiences. So that's why you're going to see a little bit more of that uh, interaction between the attendees. That's great. So, 
you know, MPI is known for being kind of trendsetters for industry education. Um, you know, you're are you're the largest uh, industry event industry association. Correct. So how do you maintain that reputation and stay innovative with the education and working with your speaker partners and um, the design of their sessions? So really, again, capitalizing on our attendee um, experience and our, um, I would say, actually our membership, we have gone back to focusing, we've had them before, but we've refocused and realigned with our special interest groups in some different areas and committees, and really made a concerted effort to reach out to them with their input on uh, in each of the special interest groups, such as third planners or um, financial planner uh, insurance type uh, event planners um, is to ask me what kind of education is missing uh, and then what would be most attractive to you what, what are some speakers you've seen in love so we pull from that and then we also have a really extensive call for proposals that we send out to uh, our previous speakers or our um, the local speakers bureaus, our education committees, and we ask people to submit with some very specific guidelines. Alex, I know you've been through this process. But <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. And shout out that Alex is speaking at the conference this year as well. Yeah. Yes, yeah. so, and so is Will. Yeah. And um, we are very specific about um, what the theming is, what we expect in terms of it being brain friendly and not lectures and it's a huge process. Um, last year, we got 550 submissions. Personally, go through every single one. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yes. Pretty much every video. You know, um, there are a lot of great people that submit, and sometimes we do a couple years with them, rotate a couple years off, just to make sure we're bringing in some new, fresh, um, fresh faces and approaches. But at the same time, you know, you don't want to get stuck with just picking new speakers that you don't trust. You've got your tried and true that you know always deliver just a, a different topic, perhaps, or a different format. Uh, I've seen a lot of speakers teaming up together that I didn't put, imagine teaming up before to do sessions, and I'm loving it. So, um, and then there's also some speakers I reach out to and say, hey, this is the topic. I don't know how to achieve these goals that we need. Can you help me? And our, our um, membership is all about it. They, they want to give back to the industry. They want to share what they know. And it's, it's been really great. Yeah, I, um, it's, it's funny that you mentioned, you know, the different topics and everything, because I, th I think people expect from me social media, and mm -hmm. I think they're going to be pleasantly surprised because one of the new sessions that I'm bringing to WC this year is on gamification and game theory that I'm going to be presenting with Will. Um, so it's going to be really interactive and super fun and uh, a, a lot to learn about, you know, the brain science and, and how you get your attendees to, uh, you know, essentially do actions that you want them to do based on game theory. So I'm super excited about this kind of new topic for me. Um, and then I'm presenting for the first time at WC um, a session on social media ROI, which is very high level. Um, it's, it's a very senior level uh, program and I'm going to be doing that twice. So yeah, I'm very excited to um, be sharing some new uh, topics. And then obviously uh, with the pre-convention, I'm going to be doing crisis communications course. So everyone sign up for that one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, it's a lot and it, it is a process. And I will say that you know, had, this is now my third year back, the process changes every year and it really shows how, um, how specifically you cater the process to what you're looking for that year. Um, and you, you do ask a lot from us speakers to create and deliver new content. Um, so it's, it's a challenge that I love, um, you know, and so kind of on that note, what do you look for from speakers and, and session topics when you're planning out the education? Mm -hmm. So um, we list pretty clearly on our call for proposals the types of what we call buckets we're looking for, but we also wanted to focus, and I had to write them down because I knew I wasn't going to remember, <laughs> um, really the critical thinking, problem solving, uh, people management, creativity, you know, for type A planners, creativity sometimes isn't easy, uh, and what the process, they want a process on how to be creative, so focusing on that. Uh, and then, you know, emotional intelligence. 
was another big piece that we were looking for as well this year. And I'm glad you mentioned crisis uh, communication certificate that you have. Um, we are working with David Lau to do a tourniquet uh, training class during WEC. Uh, I've had the privilege to hear him speak. He's spoken at WEC before, but shootings that happen at events, 30% of the people who died could have saved their lives if they had had tourniquet training to stop the bleeding. And so we're also looking at these, um, you know, out of the box type of educational experiences instead of sessions, right? That we can provide this, this type of knowledge to. We have uh, how to shoot a video um, in, in terms of sales and marketing. So we're gonna have that people can sign up to take that. Uh, we're working on more food and beverage experiences outside. So something out of the box, you know, like you said, you have to keep hitting something new, the next level. And so that's what we're trying to do. Um, and then just doing a lot of market research from what our attendees say they're looking for. Great. So Crystal, there's so much that you all <laughs> seem to be doing. <laughs> Yes. I was talking to somebody at dinner last night and she's never been to an MPI event before. And I was like, oh my God, it's in Toronto this year. You have to come. So for a first timer, because it's been a long time, even longer than you, Alex, for my first time, what would you recommend um, they get invested in when they first come and, and drink from the fire hose that is WEC? So for me personally, WEC um, last year was my first WEC. So I was on the first timer side as well as on the behind the scenes. So uh, I would say our mobile app is going to be the best thing for you. You can customize your schedules in there. Um, weeks prior, we have a lot of attendees that have conversations. So they have that icebreaker opportunity where they can meet people. And then once they get on site, they feel more comfortable about meeting up or sharing experiences that they might have gone through prior to WEC. So the mobile app is kind of like the all-in-one I say, it's like your go-to card. It's the best American Express card you can ever have. <laughs> and it has so much information and so many opportunities. And then it just enhances it once you're on site. So I would definitely say as a first time attendee, the mobile app was my best friend, just for me personally, but it also helped a lot of other people who were kind of hesitant when they're attending and kind of overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, shout out again to Crystal on that, because not only was it her first time managing WEC from uh, a concurrent education standpoint, but she was also tasked with a mobile app and making sure all the departments getting in it. So she, I would have to say the interactivity and what she picked to go in there, it was brilliant to have somebody as a first timer doing that because she with information that people were looking for that we would overlook. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. So for someone who's a bit overwhelmed, because with the 30 minute sessions, the 60 minute sessions, the 90 minute sessions, what's, what's some advice that you have, and not just for first timers, but people who are coming back, you know, who maybe weren't there last year, but have been to WC before, um, you know, what kind of advice can you give them for how to get the most out of their experience at WC this year? Crystal, you want to take that one? Now that you're a second time attending? <laughs> um, I would have to say for them to get the most out of it, it would probably be best for them to network um, within those, if you're a member, um, we hope mm -hmm. you're a member, but going to those chapter meetings it's going to help a lot um, because you have current people who have attended um, previously or they haven't attended in about 20 something years. So just having that one on one connection with uh, with our members at those chapter meetings and then creating a bond you you create, at, as you mentioned, Alice, at the prep rallies, all of the chapters came together as a unit and mm -hmm. celebrated, you know, the success of that chapter. And it was completely awesome. So just having that opportunity, if you're a member, you should be, um, <laughs> <laughs> to go forward and, and just contact that chapter and get involved in all of the things that they have coming up. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll, I'll throw in a little bit of my experience as well. Um, 
you know, get involved on social media, follow the hashtag, uh, follow the different accounts, because that's how I met the first people at my event. I knew people from my chapter, but in order for me to branch out beyond my chapter, all I had to do was go on Twitter, follow the hashtag. And I met some people who are now lifelong friends and colleagues and people I've now since worked with. Um, you know, so it's, it's definitely another way, even outside of the app to, um, start networking with people, see who's talking about it, um, and, and start joining that conversation. Even now people are, you know, on Twitter posting things about how excited they are. Um, you know, I think the keynotes, uh, were just recently posted to the website. Yeah. So, you know, get on social media, start talking about the keynotes, start sharing, you know, videos and things of them speaking at other things, things you're excited about. Um, that's a great way to start connecting with people and, and meeting them as well. Um, so. Oh, can oh, I go? Yeah. yeah, yeah, go ahead. So one of my other favorite parts every year has been the mentoring program that you all do. Is that coming back again? Because as I have met, especially locally, they always tend to pair me with someone here in the DFW area. And it's been fascinating because it's able to grow our network. And I find I learn more than back and forth, but um, it's been a good, uh, a good step forward every time we take that journey. So, yeah. so, so we're probably going to revamp the program a little bit. We find that those who are, um, I'm actually the person who did the matching. <laughs> program and I have to say you know I'd love to say we use some really awesome software to do it but we we did this old old school excel sheet and you know pairing people up um, a lot of the people who are attending in Toronto are first-time attendees so the ratios of who that would be are just off um, but we do offer a um, first-time attendee WEC for me webinar ahead of time uh, and then we are probably going to have a first time attendee, uh, haven't asked Melinda yet in our logistics department, but surprise her, um, <laughs> ask for an area for first time attendees. So at least we can facilitate some conversations. Um, the beauty of what happened with that program last year, it was a happy accident. Uh, it's actually last year was the second year we were doing it, is we only had enough uh, attendees or people a part of that program to have one mentor and three mentees which we wanted just one-on-one. -on -one. And what happened when they connected in, um, in advance or there on site uh, was that the first-time attendees then formed a little group with, a, with who was in their uh, first-time attendee group. And so the three of them would hang out all the time, could go to lunch. So we're still trying to come up with some creative ideas so that um, no one feels as if they don't have someone to talk to because that's no fun. Uh, but we're still fleshing that out in those details. So I feel like we've kind of already, I know Lindsay's like begging to ask questions. But we're already, on, we we're already on this topic and I do want to ask, what can we look forward to at WEC 2019 in Toronto? Mm -hmm. So selfishly, I'm going to start with education because that's what, um, and we have some very unusual experiences. I, I mentioned the tourniquet training. We are also really focusing on diversity and inclusion. And so we have a, uh, um, a, I wrote the name down because I don't want to say it wrong because you know I will. Uh, we've got a couple on um, leveraging conversations around diversity and inclusion. We have uh, gender diversity and inclusion where we are have some um, local members of the trans community coming in to talk about how to make our events more inclusive. Um, we have Mark uh, Valenzano who uh, is a speaker who is blind and we are going to be having doing a session where it's, um, the people in the session are blindfolded and then talk a little bit about, yeah, about the experiences, open your eyes to different concepts. And um, we, of course, we'll have Michael Dominguez because everyone loves Michael Dominguez. Everyone loves Mike. <laughs> yeah. Um, Crystal, what about for you? What are some of your favorites? Um, I would have to say uh, the chef's uh, session. That's one of our new speakers. Um, she has so many great things that she's going to be presenting on and she's new. So of course, that's always a great element. Um, let me think. Uh, currently, we have in the works uh, Duncan Wordle. He's going to be back at WEC. He was a fan favorite. Um, he's going to be presenting on the event design 
and I can't wait. <laughs> His room was standing room only, so I'm excited for him to come back. And we also have uh, a facilitated white space session. So that will teach um, planners how to use it during their events and experience it within their day as well. And then uh, we talked about mock trials. Oh, Lee Papa, uh, I don't know if you guys been to IMEX. I know, Alex, I know you have. Mm -hmm. okay, so Lee Papa is going to be at WEC. We are going to have a mindfulness lounge. It'll be open all three days. Uh, Work-life balance is a struggle for all meeting professionals. I think really anyone these days. Uh, <laughs> She will be doing up to eight meditations per day in a quiet kind of lounge space if you need a moment to go in and gather yourself. So we're very excited about that as well. And I posted uh, her website in the resources. Awesome. I'm going to selfishly ask you not to schedule me at the same time as the blind session because that sounds <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> so just don't schedule me against that. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> but we always have the topic heavy sessions, but we decided now we need to, you know, of course we want sessions that get clock hours, but we also need to have this ones that think outside of the box, which might think differently in our jobs. So. That might be the first session where I'm not live tweeting it because <laughs> I won't be able to. <laughs> <That's true>. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, Another thing that we kind of want to touch on, um, un unless Lindsay has any other questions specifically about WEC. Well, I was just going to say one of the things with WEC, as you're thinking about the education, are you allowing inside the education more open space to talk? I know you're going to have some of the mastermind ones, but a lot of it still seems, though it's interactive, still seems very... Um, driven by the professional you have at the front of the room, the speaking prof profession. Mm -hmm. That where it's driven by some of the topics the planners in the room were bringing forward. Yes, so we are doing a training session with our speakers and creating a manual of how we are asking them every 10 minutes to do some kind of activity, whether it be reflection, group work responses, um, uh, Q&A, uh, solving a problem, analogies, just so there's a little bit more room to breathe mentally for, and focus on what your intent is for that session. So yes, we are. that's one of the, I'd say the biggest changes in terms of education of what we're doing this year. And also for our education, um, as you mentioned before, Lori, we do have a lot of senior level planners who say a lot of the education is lacking in that area. So what we did was we had our meeting executive task force come together and they established some uh, senior level topics and we were able to provide speakers with those topics and see if they can alter some things to provide that. And we will also be focusing our topics on data management and profitability. So those are some exciting things that we're going to have included in our education. But yeah. profitability in a fun way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's always How fun with profit, right? Right. Money. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I, you know, before we run out of time today, I do want to talk about something that's actually coming up before WEC, uh, which is uh, the Meetings Mean Business Coalition's Global Meetings Industry Day. And I know that MPI is very actively involved in Meetings Mean Business. So I wanted to hear from you. Is there anything that you'll be doing this year um, on Global Meetings Industry Day? I believe it's April 4th. Yes. Yes, it is April 4th. And uh, Christy Casey Sanders last year did a 12-hour broadcast uh, from around the world. And I'm taking the reins this year on that. So that is my project uh, I've been working tirelessly on. And so we will still have that 12-hour broadcast. It's usually 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Central, I believe. We're still programming. And uh, we are going to have events in Asia um, where they have education. We are going to be signing proclamations. 
you know, it's, it's all around advocacy and bringing the attention to our industry and what we provide uh, in terms of economic development, social, socially what we bring into cities when we do meeting events. It's going to be very uniting. Uh, it was amazing last year. The average watch time is like three and a half hours. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, yeah, we had over a thousand people register. So we're just going to continue the momentum with the, the groundwork that she laid. And we're so excited about it. Uh, I have to say it is something I have not dabbled in before. I've done it production for about 14 years, but not virtually. So um, I'm thrilled to be trying something different. You know, we at say at WEC, at WEC, at MPI, um, that we take chances so that you don't have to. And so uh, we are really going to try to up and up the game for that broadcast as well. Awesome. And, you know, I think the broadcasting thing element is something that MPI brings to a lot of things that they do. Um, you know, obviously with last year's broadcast on uh, Global Meetings Industry Day, but also you were broadcasting during WEC last year as well. Um, and what what was that kind of decision based on? I, I know some people get a little scared of kind of, oh, well, if we're offering education online, people won't come face to face. Yeah, you know, that was one of the things that we tried last year. We're still on the fence about doing it for WC this year, and I'll I'll tell you a little bit why. So uh, you have to be careful when you're promoting any kind of um, virtual event alongside your, like you said, you don't want people then to choose not to attend uh, in person. So what we offered was about a month out a um, digital pass that would give you the general sessions and, um, you know, some of the education. So it was just a a little bit of a taste of it. And it did go very well. Um, You know, if there's a sponsor on the table for this year, maybe there'll be a little different story. But uh, if anyone out there is looking to do that. But um, it is very labor intensive. You have to have a virtual host that really tees it up, takes questions from the audience. Um, I think we offered that at $99 last year. Yes. Um, it's something that we're still considering, um, but we it's got to make good business sense. So uh, we are working to try to get our sessions captured. I'm also responsible for um, sourcing the webinars at MPI and figuring out, you know, do we add this to our, our list of offerings that people for on-demand education Um, But I'm a big proponent that we really have got to get away from the slides with audio overlay. You know, if you're going to do it, you got to do it with a camera and seeing the person's face presenting it. So we're still working on our strategy and our plan for that. But um, it was successful last year. Great. Yeah, it's um, the online is it's it's kind of scary a little bit, especially as a speaker, because you're like, you're trying to connect with the people who are there in person, but you're also trying to make sure that you don't leave out the people who are online. Um, I got, I got to do a little cameo uh, at WC last year uh, with Chrissy, but um, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's interesting. Actually, um, you know, we're doing my uh, crisis communications course for the first time online uh, this month on March 15th. So uh, that's exciting. And I, I just got to experience, we're actually doing it on Zoom, on the mm-hmm. Zoom platform. And um, I just got to experience some of the um, fe- newer features that we're going to be using, uh, like breakout rooms and things like that. So um, I'm really excited about that opportunity. Um, but that's something that, you know, MPI does really well is, like you said, taking those chances um, and and trying new things so that, um, you know, you don't have to, <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, right. you, you can try the things that work. Mm-hmm. Um, so from that perspective, uh, as we're kind of wrapping up today, from the perspective of knowing what things work and what don't, if you could only pick one, what is your one tip you have for event planners? Mm. It's a tough Christmas. question. You look like you got one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah um i think my one tip would be get outside of your industry 
Um, so many times we get stuck within our industry and unfortunately it becomes stale. Um, so being able to go to, for example, to go to a scuba diving convention and you never know, you might see the greatest speaker of your life just by you just going outside of your industry, just taking that risk and, and just seeing what's out there. You never know what another industry might have to offer you. So that would be my one tip for anyone you know it's gonna sound like i'm um kissing up <laughs> to my uh company i work for organization but um for me it's per taking investing in my professional development uh, is the most important i recently i don't know how i'm going to manage it all but i will find a way um applied to the master's degree program that we are uh, partnering with san diego state university yeah so i and i think uh you know it, we're always so busy but you need to put yourself first sometimes and whether that's hey making a commitment to yourself to watch one webinar a month right um and i've also been trying to give myself 10 minutes each morning blocked off on my calendar where I can actually read those emails with tips in the magazines and stuff. Cause I get them and I don't open them. So uh, invest in yourself. Awesome. And, you know, before we get to the last question about resources, I, I do want to ask, you know, because you're from MPI and we don't get an opportunity to talk to MPI very often. So I, I kind of want to hear, you know, outside of WEC and, Global Meetings Industry Day, you know, what else is going on in MPI? How can people get involved? Um, how can they become members? You know, and any last pitch for MPI <laughs> that, uh, that you want to share with our audience? Because, I, you know, I've been a member since I was in grad school myself, getting my master's degree. And, you know, it changed the game for me. And I, I always looked at my peers who weren't going to MPI events. And I was like, is there a reason that, like, you don't want a job when you graduate? Because <laughs> this, this degree is really expensive. And you are not investing in your professional development outside of the master's degree. And I was like, you're missing all the important networking. And I got my first job out of grad school from someone who I was volunteering with on a committee in my MPI chapter. Um, so, you know, I understand the importance of MPI, but for, for those of you who are watching, you know, um, you know, what's going on with MPI, what's new, um, you know, why would, why should someone join MPI? Mm. Chris, we got one or you want me to go? Go first. <laughs> um, so outside of the fact that there's education and best practices, I have to say, um, and I, I don't want to say the member's name out loud because it's, it's personal personal for her, but we have a um, member that we've known for years and years who um, just finished treatment for cancer. And uh, what was interesting uh, that I heard from her is that she had friends, or I heard of her story, is that she had friends that she had made through an MPI, not that live locally, but those who lived in different states who flew in to spend time with her and rotate. And, and so it's more than the, just the education. It is about the relationships that you make with people that you form a common bond with. So um, even some of the speakers, Dr. Tyra Hilliard that uh, lives not far from me, you know, I reached out to her when I need something or Joanne Dennison when I need advice personally, professionally, or on a topic. There's people who I know that I can reach out to. And I don't think that you can create that kind of community um, on your own. You've got to jump in and you get out what you put in. So I would have to say uh, relationships. Um, go ahead, Alex. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just going to say, and Crystal, what would you like to share? Um, I, uh, one thing that I would like to share is, and I'm going to do a shameless plug, but, uh, we do have a membership bundle with our, <laughs> with our package this year. It's a great opportunity. Um, like I said, I was introduced to MT MPI when I was in college, my advisor spoke highly of MPI and I'm just like, what is this? It's in Dallas. Like, what are you talking about? And so <laughs> he told me about all of the benefits and come to find out he was not a member anymore. And that was the opportunity for myself to go back and reconnect with him. Like, so, you know, I work for MPI and I need to be a member. So <laughs> 
it's just like Laura said, that connection that you established. It's so many people that are inside the industry and that are a part of members and they're great people to have connections with. It's amazing. You can connect with anyone across the world and you will not have the opportunity if it was not for MPI. So I, I'm very, very appreciative of the things that MPI has done for me personally, as well as professionally and the people that I've been able to meet. So get those bundles. <laughs> <laughs> and that just reminded me of something quick. I know we don't have tons of time, but I, sometimes I hear when I, I I work remotely. I'm in Jacksonville, Florida, so I'm actually not at the headquarter office. But sometimes I, I hear sometimes the perception is that MPI headquarters is a, um, too hard to reach. It's you can't get a direct line. And, you know, I, I want to put in the resources, what have you, I, since I do education and webinars, I am always available to chat and talk about, hey, what education are you missing? What do you what kind of webinars? I can get a webinar source for you. Where the resources, you know, people don't need to hesitate to call. We have a, a great team who are do what we do because we're passionate about the industry and we have a very customer service forward facing approach. And I don't mind getting called and asked. I don't like being put on the telemarketer sales. <laughs> Like, I don't mind asking, uh, answering any questions and helping people. Awesome. And so, yeah, you know, it's funny because I went to headquarters for the first time last year and it was very different than what I was, I don't know what I was expecting, <laughs> but it was just like, I walked in there and the MPI rolled out the red carpet and I was just like, okay, I, I, I see you MPI. I see you. <laughs> <laughs> and you know they they really did make me feel uh at home there and i i think that's a testament to um not only mpi and the goals and objectives and mission statement of mpi but also the staff um so you know props to you thank you <laughs> Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch the transcription and all of the resources mentioned, head to www.helloendless.com slash blog. This week's episode will be posted and available by next Tuesday. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode. Share your biggest takeaway and join the social conversation sponsored by Little Bird Told Media. Just tag your post with hashtag event icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern right here on hashtag event icons.